Welcome back to Interpretations. I'm Owen Gray. In this series, I've been taking a historical and critical look at the first chapter of Ralph Ellison's novel Invisible Man from 1952. And now we've reached the final part. No. Why are you playing the final countdown? This is what the chapter has been leading up to. The superintendent of schools invited the narrator to come give his graduation speech in front of the town's leading white citizens at their smoker. And after making it through all of the traps that the white men set for the narrator, from the naked blonde to the 10-person battle royal, to the title match with Tatlock, to the electrified rug for the rewards, we finally get to hear the narrator give his speech. Given everything that's come before, there are probably some pitfalls and traps that lay in store for our narrator in this section. As you listen to this section of the text, think about the dynamic that's going on between what the narrator is thinking, what the narrator is saying, and how the white men are acting in response. Content warnings for this section include some anti-black racism. Now, with those remarks out of the way, let's return to the novel. The MC knocked on the table for quiet. Gentlemen, he said, we almost forgot an important part of the program. A most serious part, gentlemen. This boy was brought here to deliver a speech which he made at his graduation yesterday. Bravo! I'm told that he is the smartest boy we've got out there in Greenwood. I'm told he knows more big words than a pocket-sized dictionary. Much applause and laughter. The compliment the MC pays here, more big words than a pocket-sized dictionary, has always seemed like damning with faint praise to me. This might be a misconception on my part, but I think of a pocket-sized dictionary as akin to a foreign language dictionary and focused on everyday speech rather than the full breadth and complexity of the language. The textual fact of the white men laughing could be interpreted as evidence to support that inference. So now, gentlemen, I want you to give him your attention. There was still laughter as I faced them, my mouth dry, my eye throbbing. I began slowly, but evidently my throat was tense, because they began shouting, Louder! Louder! We of the younger generation extol the wisdom of that great leader and educator, I shouted, who first spoke these flaming words of wisdom. A ship lost at sea for many days suddenly sighted a friendly vessel. From the mast of the unfortunate vessel was seen a signal. Water! Water! We die of thirst! The answer from the friendly vessel came back. Cast down your bucket where you are! The captain of the distressed vessel, at last heeding the injunction, cast down his bucket, and it came up full of fresh, sparkling water from the mouth of the Amazon River. And like him, I say, and in his words, to those of my race who depend upon bettering their condition in a foreign land, or who underestimate the importance of cultivating friendly relations with the southern white man, who is his next-door neighbor, I would say, cast down your bucket where you are. Cast it down in making friends in every manly way of the people of all races by whom we are surrounded. So, this is what the chapter has been building up to. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this section. Now, the image of a black man giving a speech about racism is a trope that appears in a lot of books I've read by black authors. Here, in Invisible Man, in Black Boy by Richard Wright, and in How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. It's also something that I've seen in my life from Bill Cosby to Chris Rock to Barack Obama. In my experience, most of these speeches include a politically conservative message that expects individualism to combat systemic racism. Kendi refers to this as uplift suasion, the goal being to persuade white people to give up their racist ideas by showing them that black people are just like them. Attempts by black people to assimilate into the dominant white culture have largely failed because white people continue to be indoctrinated with white supremacist ideas. And so I think the idea of assimilation is sort of a white supremacist idea because it asks black people to rise to a standard set by white people. Now. Most of the narrator's speech is a quotation, so I think some math might be warranted here. 
Wait. Wait. Just hear me out. This is basically as much of the speech as we're given. Let's pause and take a look at how much is the narrator's original work and how much is quoted. So the total number of words, excluding speaker tags in this paragraph, is 172. Words introducing the quotation, there's 31, or about 18%. And then words within the quotation are 141, or about 82%. So the narrator has been praised for his intelligence, but 82% of what he says has been taken from Booker T. Washington's Atlanta Compromise speech, which, from my reading, seems to encourage black people to remain in the South instead of leaving, and to, quote, cultivate friendly relations with the Southern white man, end quote. Here, Washington seems to be talking to other black people about their responsibility in ending racism. This is a trend that white people continue to amplify to this day. And rather than accept that white supremacy is the problem, and rather than recognize that it's white people who need to dismantle white supremacist ideology, white people seem to want black people to solve racism. Now, this next section here has always struck me as particularly significant. Consider pausing the video and commenting below with your interpretation before listening to mine. I spoke automatically, and with such fervor that I did not realize that the men were still talking and laughing until my dry mouth, filling up with blood from the cut, almost strangled me. I coughed, wanting to stop and go to one of the tall brass sand-filled spittoons to relieve myself, but a few of the men, especially the superintendent, were listening, and I was afraid. So I gulped it down, blood, saliva, and all, and continued. What powers of endurance I had during those days! What enthusiasm! What a belief in the rightness of things! I spoke even louder in spite of the pain. But still they talked, and still they laughed, as though deaf with cotton in dirty ears. So I spoke with greater emotional emphasis. I closed my ears and swallowed blood until I was nauseated. The speech seemed a hundred times as long as before, but I could not leave out a single word. All had to be said, each memorized nuance considered, rendered. Nor was that all. Whenever I uttered a word of three or more syllables, a group of voices would yell for me to repeat it. These paragraphs are placed next to each other, and we have to look at the juxtaposition. In an earlier video, I pointed out how the word circus appears three times in the chapter, and that was enough to make me think that it was significant and had weight and import worthy of interpretation. The word blood appears ten times in the chapter. Blood is still commonly used to refer to family and ancestry. It's the blood that's trying to stop him from speaking as he's trying to repeat and build upon the ideas of Booker T. Washington. I think it's important to stop and think about that here. We have to contrast the idealism of Washington's words with the reality of the black experience in America and the narrator's experience. The white men are not listening to the narrator. They are treating him at best like a circus attraction. See how this all starts to tie together? The fact that they make him repeat polysyllabic words strengthens my previous inference about damning him with faint praise, and also brings to mind the backhanded compliment, he speaks so well. I used the phrase, social responsibility, and they yelled, What's that word you say, boy? Social responsibility, I said. What? Social. Louder. Responsibility. More. Respond. Repeat. Sibility. This section here, where they're making him almost chant the phrase social responsibility, again calls to mind uplift suasion and the idea that it's black people, not white people, who have the responsibility to end racism. Again, racism is definitely a problem. I'm not trying to deny that, but I think it's actually a symptom. The real problem is white supremacy and yeah. capitalism. The room filled with the uproar of laughter until, no doubt, distracted by having to gulp down my blood, I made a mistake and yelled a phrase I had often seen denounced in newspaper editorials, heard debated in private. Social! What? They yelled. Equality! Here, after gulping down blood for the fourth time, he changes the script and shouts, Social equality. 
This reinforces my earlier inference that the images of swallowing blood are about betraying his ancestors and his so-called race. Before we continue, I want you to imagine what might happen next. Let me know in the comments below what you think. The laughter hung smoke-like in the sudden stillness. I opened my eyes, puzzled. Sounds of displeasure filled the room. The MC rushed forward. They shouted hostile phrases at me, but I did not understand. A small, dry, mustached man in the front row blared out, Say that slowly, son! What, sir? What you just said! Social responsibility, sir! I said. You weren't being smart, were you, boy? He said, not unkindly. No, sir! You sure that about equality was a mistake? Oh, yes, sir, I said. I was swallowing blood. Listen to those last two lines again. You sure that about equality was a mistake? Oh, yes, sir, I said. I was swallowing blood. I hope, if you weren't convinced before when I talked about the juxtaposition of text of the speech against the image of swallowing blood, you're convinced now. What Ellison was doing at the paragraph level before, he's doing at the sentence level now. The images are repeated and juxtaposed, but at a closer interval. And again, I want to emphasize the repetition in this section. As I noted above, the word blood appears ten times in the chapter, and five of those instances occur in the context of blood choking the narrator while he's trying to give his speech. The density of the repetition of the word blood here clues us in to its importance. If you're ever wondering if something in a story has symbolic value or there's subtext to it, consider how many times it is mentioned in the text. Well, you had better speak more slowly so we can understand. I mean to do right by you, but you've got to know your place at all times. All right, now go on with your speech. And right here, this man makes the subtext of white supremacy that has permeated this whole chapter plain. Remember this section in a few minutes when the superintendent of schools speaks. I was afraid. I wanted to leave, but I wanted also to speak, and I was afraid they'd snatch me down. Thank you, sir, I said, beginning where I had left off and having them ignore me as before. Yet. When I finished, there was thunderous applause. I was surprised to see the superintendent come forth with a package wrapped in white tissue paper and, gesturing for quiet, address the men. Gentlemen, you see that I did not overpraise this boy. He makes a good speech, and someday he'll lead his people in the proper paths. And I don't have to tell you that that is important in these days and times. This is a good, smart boy. And so, to encourage him in the right direction, in the name of the Board of Education, I wish to present him a prize in the form of this. He paused, removing the tissue paper and revealing a gleaming calfskin briefcase. In the form of this first-class article from Shad Whitmore's shop. Boy, he said, addressing me, take this prize and keep it well. Consider it a badge of office. Prize it. Keep developing as you are, and someday it will be filled with important papers that will help you shape the destiny of your people. I want to focus on the phrasing of proper paths and right direction here, and call back to the man who said, you've got to know your place at all times, a moment ago. Remember, too, the narrator was viewed as an example of good conduct and praised by the white men of his town. In a previous video, I pointed out that education can recreate and reinforce existing power structures. Here, the superintendent is sort of deputizing the narrator as a leader of black people, but only as long as he upholds the white supremacist structure by trying to lead his fellow black people into assimilation. I was so moved that I could hardly express my thanks. A rope of bloody saliva forming a shape like an undiscovered continent drooled upon the leather and I wiped it quickly away. I felt an importance that I had never dreamed. The phrase, 
quote, like an undiscovered continent, unquote, is dense with symbolism. It first makes me think of how Africa was described as the dark continent and incomplete maps I saw in history books that showed it just as a dark splotch in middle and high school. Now the phrase also makes me think of America, which was an undiscovered country, so to speak, until 1492. Now, while the transatlantic slave trade is often described as beginning with Jamestown when enslaved African people were brought to what is now the United States, it actually began with Columbus. He captured and sent the native Taino people back to Europe as slaves. The bloody rope could be a reference to the bloody history of the United States for black people in shaping the nation we know today. And finally, the words undiscovered continent appear in one of Emily Dickinson's poems, which is number 832 in my edition. Soto, explore thyself. There in thyself shalt find the undiscovered continent. No settler had the mind. I don't know if Ellison would agree with Dickinson here. I think the white men want to colonize the narrator's mind, and given some of my earlier statements, they appear to have been successful in already establishing a colony therein. Open it and see what's inside, I was told. My fingers a tremble. I complied, smelling the fresh leather and finding an official looking document inside. It was a scholarship for the State College for Negroes. My eyes filled with tears and I ran awkwardly off the floor. I was overjoyed. I did not even mind when I discovered that the gold pieces I had scrambled for were brass pocket tokens, advertising a certain make of automobile. I think the fact that he's receiving a scholarship to the State College for Negroes is important. I would assume, given everything going on before, that this is a college run by white men with impure motives. If I'm wrong, and if it's run by black people, it could still be corrupted by ideas like uplift suasion or through donations given by white men with strings and stipulations. I'm reminded of a quote, which I'm a little embarrassed to admit I learned from this cartoon, by Asada Shakur. No one is going to give you the education you need to overthrow them. This could be a further example of education being used as a form of control. This college will teach him, quote, the proper paths, unquote, and, quote, encourage him in the right direction, unquote. To my mind, the hollowness of the opportunities that he will be afforded at this college is further emphasized by his scholarship being juxtaposed with the next image. The gold pieces turned out to have been advertising tokens. What he thinks will be a golden opportunity to expand his mind may turn out to be worthless advertising or propaganda for the existing system. When I reached home, everyone was excited. Next day, the neighbors came to congratulate me. I even felt safe from grandfather, whose deathbed curse usually spoiled my triumphs. I stood beneath his photograph with my briefcase in hand and smiled triumphantly into that stolid black peasant's face. It was a face that fascinated me. The eyes seemed to follow everywhere I went. That night, I dreamed I was at a circus with him, and that he refused to laugh at the clowns, no matter what they did. The circus imagery returns. I imagine the reason the grandfather refuses to laugh is because the clowns represent black people. Remember that earlier, in the section I called the title match, the narrator referred to Tatlock as a stupid clown who was, quote, ruining his chances, unquote. Then later, he told me to open my briefcase and read what was inside, and I did, finding an official envelope stamped with the state seal. And inside the envelope, I found another, and another, endlessly, and I thought I would fall of weariness. Them's years, he said. So this section is really interesting. Each of the years of the narrator's life will be stamped with the state's seal. This detail recalls the inference I made above that they are sending him to the State College for Negroes as a form of control. He's not his own man, but rather, at some level, the property of the state. Now open that one. And I did. And in it, I found an engraved document containing a short message in letters of gold. Read it, my grandfather said. Out! Loud. To whom it may concern, 
I intoned. Keep this boy running. This to me says that the narrator will find no rest or respite. Everywhere he goes, he will have to face the white supremacist system. There's no escape. I awoke to the old man's laughter ringing in my ears. It was a dream I was to remember, and dream again for many years after. But at the time, I had no insight into its meaning. First, I had to attend college. And that's the end of part six. We finished the chapter. Thank you so much for watching. Before I conclude my analysis, I want to call back to the first couple of paragraphs. Remember that Ellison was very concerned that we understood when this novel was taking place. He was writing this about 80 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, and I'm doing my interpretation about 70 years after it was published. And I wonder, would Ellison recognize America today? I think the answer is, unfortunately, yes. Whenever I've had the opportunity to teach A Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry to black students, they've always commented on how familiar the dynamics between the younger family feel and how relatable the struggles of the younger family remain. I think in some ways that's true about Invisible Man as well. The white supremacist power structure is still in place. Perhaps it's more subtle today than it was in the 1940s and 50s, but it's still present with us. One of my guiding principles in doing this analysis was a quote from Karl Marx. The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. And I think that idea applies to Ellison's work as well. He wasn't just interpreting racism and white supremacy. He was hoping to change it. And I hope, through this close reading, you have changed as well. Thank you so much for watching this series. If you haven't read the rest of Invisible Man, I encourage you to seek it out. If you liked this video, please give it a like. And if you didn't like it, well, go ahead and give it a dislike. I look forward to having a conversation with you in the comments, particularly if you pause the video at certain points and put your own interpretations in as you are watching. If you think others would benefit from this video series, I hope that you'll share it on social media. If you really like the work that I'm doing here and wish to support me financially and are able to, you can find my Patreon at patreon.com slash onxgray. You can also follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash onxgray and on Facebook at facebook.com slash onxgray. Again, thank you so much for watching, and until next time, keep interpreting.